Thank you for downloading this episode of Case Notes. Case Notes was recorded at the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh. Visit our website to find out about our latest events. And please support us and help us to reach new audiences by liking, following, or leaving a comment on whatever podcast platform you are listening on. We hope you enjoy the talk. Thank you very much uh, for all coming today and thank you for your interest in something which has fascinated me for the best part now of probably almost 17 years. I think as a historian of 18th century death and dying and mostly funerals, one of the things that really fascinates me about it is that it's an immensely transitional time. It's a period that takes us from what might be perceived as the traditions of the 17th century all the way through to the Victorian way of death. But in and of itself, as much as I might love the 18th century, and I think we'll all get a sense of that today, it's not the only period of transition because change is almost as constant as death itself. And often change happens for different reasons, maybe innovation or tradition. But what I find to be most true throughout history is that people, when approaching a funeral when making those decisions, or even having those decisions made for them by others, end up depending on a mixture of logistics and personal decisions. And that means that really, in any one period of time, the funeral can be wildly different, depending on maybe where you are or what time you're experiencing. And for that reason, obviously, generalization is a big risk. But Because I am an enterprising historian who likes to get himself into trouble, I thought today I would take us on a very exciting journey through the history of the funeral, framed around the coffin. Now, if we take a look here at one of my favourite images, Undertaker's Inn at the Death, we see a rather striking moment. An elderly man has been cornered by the King of Terrors. He stands there with an hourglass in one hand, and a dart in the other. He's about to strike. But because this is the 18th century, and because it's such a highly competitive time for the funeral trade, some undertakers have got wind of what's going on. And they're diving in to catch him and to seize his trade before someone else comes and does it. Now, I suppose an obvious question would be, well, Dan, how do you know they're undertakers? Well, often the easiest way of telling is the coffin that's being carried on the head of the gentleman in the corner. So today the coffin will be our vehicle through time, a bit like the TARDIS you've seen in the exhibition, and it will take us through a very interesting journey from the medieval to the modern. And I think what we'll see as we go through this journey is that as much as there's change, there's often continuity in death. But at the centre of all things, there's always a coffin. So we start here with a medieval funeral. It's a very sombre image. We have a coffin surrounded by mourners dressed in black with black hoods. At the very edge of the image, we have three attendants in white. One of them has a bucket and a sprinkler for some holy water, and another individual is carrying a cross. In the funeral, these devices would have been used to process the coffin to a place of interment. We can see that a service is being performed over the coffin, And I think what we can see here is that the coffin in this particular time is a fairly exclusive item. It's an item that sits at the centre of a very carefully arranged and orchestrated ritual, one which involves lots of different parts, whether they be people or whether they be inanimate objects. Now, another really interesting thing if we look at this image here is that the coffin is not the shape that we would recognise today. This is a gable-lidded coffin, um, A coffin which, if anything, would look a bit like it has a house shape to it, or quite possibly, to use another example, a Toblerone-shaped coffin. (laughs) And this little gable lid is very fashionable at the time. And this is a time when the majority of common funerals don't involve coffins at all. Most people are being wrapped in a shroud and buried in the earth. Coffins are very expensive items, and often they'll only be used for intramural burials, such as burials in the church. If we take another look, at a medieval image of a funeral, we see the procession that might have come beforehand. 
And here we get a sense of the amount of logistics involved. There are people, lots of mourners in hoods. There are lots of churchmen preceding the coffin. The coffin is surrounded by tapers. These are all things that would have to have been organized and then put into position with people acting out their roles at the right time. In the medieval period, the coffin, in this instance, is at the center of a very statist rite. And it's interesting, too, that the medium by which we see these images, the books of ours, are also items that are possessed by people of status. These are people of status who are using fancy images of coffins as a devotional aid. Now, if we skip slightly forward in time, we see here the funeral of Lady Jane Lumley. Now, there are many similarities here. Once again, we have a coffin being processed under a heavy pool. We have lots of mourners clad in black. But we also have a shot of colour here, because this is a heraldic funeral. Lady Lumley's funeral was organised by the Royal College of Arms, and their heralds oversaw all aspects of funeral arrangement for people of rank and status. In this period, the funeral was essentially a way of communicating one's rank and status to those around, through the banners which are being carried by the heralds wearing tabards, and also via escutcheons on the coffin. This was a fairly reasonably expensive process. The heralds could decide what you needed, and you couldn't really argue with their choices either. So for the people who were eligible, this was perhaps a rather difficult time, but you would go along with it because it was expected, and that was what essentially equated respectability. What's also interesting is that during this time, for common people, the coffin has started to make an appearance, albeit in the form of a parish coffin. This is a reusable device, far less glamorous than some of the coffins being consumed by affluent people, but essentially a device that conveys you to the grave so your enshrouded body can be placed in the grave. If we skip forward to the 17th century, things are getting more recognisable. At least they are in plague-stricken London. This image shows us two visions of a plague outbreak in the 1640s. At the top, we have London, and London is respectable. London has a coffin with a pool, three well-dressed bearers, and all the mourners behind are carrying sprigs of rosemary, which is a really good nosegay, something to fragrance the air up a bit if it's smelling rather bad in and around the dead. This is juxtaposed with a rather fancifully bad image of things in the countryside. Here we have a group of half-naked men who are hauling dead bodies on sleds toward a river where they're promptly tossed into the river. Now, this is obviously meant to force us in a particular direction. We're meant to read this as being evidence that London, of all places, is a place of respectability and decency. But this is really interesting too, because although we can see this as a slightly fanciful image, we can learn from it that the coffin is starting to be seen as something respectable, something necessitous, maybe. Now, in this period, people are starting to buy and be buried in private coffins more frequently. This is driving work for carpenters, people who've got knowledge and skills in building square or almost square-shaped things. And this would have some consequences, which, for me personally, are immensely fascinating. So, without further ado, let's head to the 18th century. And in the 18th century, we find the funeral card of an undertaker named Humphrey Drew. And this tells us lots of interesting things about the coffin's journey from a medieval item of status all the way to a necessitous product. Because here we have an undertaker's advertising materials. We're meant to look at this and think, I want Mr. Drew to oversee my funerals because he knows what's best. The image shows us what might appear at first to be quite a familiar scene. We've got another coffin with another pool on it. Perched on top of the pool are ostrich plumes, and we can see some escutcheons down the side. But there are no heralds here, because by this time, in the early 18th century, the herald's monopoly on funerals, particularly funerals of people of status, has been outstripped by the undertakers. The undertakers have taken over this niche because they can offer flexibility. You don't have to have the funeral that the heralds suggest. You could have a more glamorous one with more different items and attendance, or you could have a more reserved one. It can be at whatever time of day you choose. This doesn't have to be the daytime. It could be the nighttime. What's also very interesting is that the heraldic items on the coffin no longer have to reflect an actual urn title. They could be imagined. They could be created bespoke for your needs. 
um, a lot of the people who establish themselves as undertakers can do these things because they have prior experience. They have prior knowledge of having interacted either with heralds or later on, they're people who've maybe worked in funerary businesses. So what sorts of people become undertakers? Well, and when we think about funeral directors today, we might have an expectation of the skill sets involved. An undertaker in 18th century England can literally be anybody. What really determines whether or not your business works is if you're actually successful. Lots of people have skills that are good for undertaking, however. Carpenters can make things from wood, so we can understand how they might make coffins. People who work with lead might be good at making lead shells to go inside those coffins to contain the dead body. People who make tin plate items might be able to make little uh, decorations for the tops of coffins. And all of these people have a tiny kernel of knowledge from which a funeral business can grow. So quite often when we see undertakers in the 18th century, they're not working solely as undertakers. They might be like Mr. Lucas here, working as a broker, a sworn appraiser, and an auctioneer at the same time. There are actually, quite notably, a large number of auctioneer undertakers. Um, <laughs> auctioneer undertakers combines a whole lot of really interesting skills where if you know how to make something, you know what it's worth, or at least people will trust that you know what it's worth. You can then take that a step further by becoming an undertaker using those skills, and then you can sell the people's goods afterwards. If your job works really well, you might become a full-time undertaker. But if not, you might carry on. You might even give up the line of business. Now, for some people, there are so many undertakers that a secondary trade develops. And this develops partly because undertakers are, in essence, middlemen. They're not making all the things that are required for a funeral. They are essentially just making a few things and then using business links to gather those other items together. So if you know lots of good people, if you know the right people, you can organize really good funerals, even if maybe you only make coffins. If you don't make coffins, however, you might seek the services of a coffin maker. Now, coffin makers were essentially carpenters who found a really useful line of work in making coffins, selling them to private people and also to the trade. Some coffin makers would undertake funerals as well, and again, that reflects the flexibility of this early trade. It really is what people make it. One really interesting thing is that by this time, the trade is recognized by the coffin. The coffin becomes a symbol of the funerary businesses, whatever the, the other careers that people might have are. Now, we can see a really good example of this in William Greenwood's card, because William Greenwood advertises himself at the sign of the three coffins. We can actually brilliantly see William's sign at the very top of his trade card, where you can see his three coffins hanging on tiny little hooks as if they're outside his shop. Other examples would include the sign of first and last, which would have a baby's crib mounted alongside a coffin. On the one hand, a memento mori reminding us about the passage of life. On the other hand, a really good advert that if you can make a coffin, you can probably make a baby's crib as well. So you've got both <laughs> ends of life covered. So much so um, was the coffin recognized as an example of the trade that in popular culture we start to see examples of undertakers usually bent double under the weight of a coffin. Now there is no evidence, I've been doing this for 17 years and I've yet to find evidence of an undertaker legitimately carrying a coffin around on his back. A lot of the, the really fancy ones like these would have been so expensive, possibly with one or two wooden shells, with a lead shell inside, you, you wouldn't want to carry that on your own, let alone on your back. But this image of the undertaker kind of trapped under his coffin becomes a symbol of the trade. So when, for example, here in Woodward's an undertaker in distress, we see an undertaker prowling for work on the streets of 18th century London, in this case, bursting into a rather sociable dinner with punch. Um, we find undertakers who, once again, are defined by their coffin. Now, the coffin itself was a changeable item. It wasn't fixed. Its design, while simple, whilst repeatable, could be augmented in lots of different ways to meet the desires of the customer, but also to respond to panics. Here we have a coffin that belonged to Jarvis and Sons, who are a rather enterprising London business, who decided to take on the body snatches with a mind-blowingly complicated coffin with lots of different locks in it and metal bars. 
The idea was that you could probably break this coffin open, but by the time you did it, that body would be so decayed that no self-respecting medical school would buy the body. So this takes us on a step further. So far, we have just seen coffins being carried around by people. This was for mostly practical reasons. Coffins um, are easy for groups of people to transport from a household to a parish burial ground. But as the place of burial moves out of the town and becomes suburban, as it moves into the cemeteries that we understand today, people need forms of transport to take the body to those places of burial. And this is where we start to see the arrival of hearses that we would recognize today. Hearses of one form or another have been around for a long time, but they've been fairly exclusive items. Here, in a stock image from the 19th century, we see a vision of a hearse that's not dissimilar to the kind that we see today. Probably the most notable difference is that the hearse doesn't have any glass panes at the back. The glass panes would come slightly later, when improvements in glass technology meant that people could actually make a lovely flat plane of glass that once again would put the coffin at the centre of display in the funeral. This means that Whereas in the 18th century, certainly the late 18th century, people had been transported in these windowless boxes that had acted as an avatar for the deceased. Now they had a way of putting the coffin on show, encouraging people to augment the coffin or to put other decorations in there with it. Now with so many items, we might think that the trade was incredibly popular. It certainly was commercially popular, but people were still highly critical. In the 19th century, people would make various different complaints about the cost of funerals, and here we see a cartoon from Punch called The Star Die Undertakers, which imagines a group of undertakers who've lost business because essentially people have come to common sense and realized that most of their goods are not necessitous in any way. We have the mute in the center with his stave, we have the featherman with a board of feathers on top of his head, and we have a chap carrying a hatchment that hints at the the gain which the undertakers make from the deaths and the loss of others. Instead of having memorial items on it, the hatchment contains symbols of leisure, a tankard, some crossed pipes, and some cocktail glasses. Notably absent is the coffin, because by this period it was an expectation that people would have a coffin, that they would in some way, um, no matter how poor they were, be accommodated um, in some basic form of a coffin. And there are numerous scandals in the 19th century involving workhouses and undertakers, where undertakers are accused of using coffins that weren't adequate, that weren't up to the task, or compounding various different bodies into coffins. These, again, reflect the fact that people started to see the coffin as being necessitous. Now, by the 20th century, the vehicle that the coffin is traveling in has changed again. The motor hearse starts to come into view. The motor hearse doesn't fully replace the traditional horse-drawn hearse. We still see those around today. But it offers another opportunity for people to be transported, um, often, once again, depending on how much money they've got. The different vehicles used can make different statements about people's um, status in society also and we see this increasingly into the 21st century, even when we have electric hearses now. We have various companies have Tesla hearses. Um, there's a sense of being seen in a vehicle that's fashionable. You know, you have Jaguars, you have um, Rolls Royces. Up until this point, I've discussed items which were successful. I thought as I draw things to a close, I would focus on something which sounds like a really good idea, but demonstrates the point I've tried to make about how sometimes, for some reasons, things just don't work in the funeral trade. This is a Bakelite coffin. In the 20th century, Bakelite was a wonder material, um, essentially combining wood flour with phenol formaldehyde to make something that you could mold, a bit like we mold plastic items today. The Bakelite coffin seemed like it was going to be on a really good positive track. Uh, there's a newspaper report about 50,000 coffins being bought by India because there are various different beetles and creatures that are eating through the wood, and the Bakelite coffin will answer that. Part of the problem there, though, is that the Bakelite coffin doesn't decompose in any way. It just remains in the ground as it was put. Um, so there was a lot of hostility to the coffin from local authorities, people who didn't want Bakelite coffins to be buried in soil. 
And in Hartlepool, a group of councillors discussed the issue um, because essentially one undertaker had just buried a Bakelite coffin without asking for permission. And one of the councillors rather frustratedly stated that if a hard lump of dirt happens to fall on it, it may smash the top of the coffin. And you can imagine the effect of that. So once again, in the early 20th century, the coffin is there to act as a barrier between the living and the dead. It starts to fail, it starts to lose respectability if for some reason it might be broken. So I'd like to draw things to a close by kind of reflecting on the, the enormous sort of five to 600 year journey we've just taken and potentially my hubris in attempting that. Um, I think what I wanted to communicate today was that the funeral is one of these fascinating responses to the problem of death and a problem which is on the one hand very personal but also has lots of different, very interesting dimensions that reflect the way that societies see both living and the dead and also the way that people can commercialise things around them, things that might change, things where people's understanding and appreciation of something might change rapidly and sometimes might change more slowly. Um, so with that in mind, I'd like to thank you all for listening um, and thank you very much. <laughs>